everyone, and welcome to the Her Journey Told podcast. On this show, we will focus on strengthening women's mental fitness through sharing the joy, struggle, and wisdom of each woman's journey. Our show is powered by Pivotal Moments. Go to PivotalMoments.org to learn more. Hello, and welcome to the Her Journey Told podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Pivotal Moments Media. I'm your host, Sandy Lutton, and I'm super excited to have Christine Haas joining me today. How are you, Christine? Very good. Thank you so much for having me today. And I I love your podcast and what you're doing. So grateful to be here. So Christine, tell us a little more about your career. I know that you started out in journalism and was a news anchor and investigative reporter, and you even won multiple Emmys. Give us a little bit of background on how you got into journalism. Oh, gosh, I loved journalism from the very get go. Um, My background, really, I grew up riding horses and uh, I was, uh, you know, a very expensive habit for my parents, (laughs) but it was such a passion. And I always said, I hope that I can find something that I love to do professionally as much as I loved riding, you know, and competing. And uh, it started from, you know, just in college, I was on one of those really bad cable news (laughs) programs in in school where you produce it yourself and you learn how to do it. And I just got the bug and I loved it. And uh, it just, it, it was, I remember my first job was in Amarillo, Texas, and I'm originally from Chicago. And I remember thinking to myself, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. You know, and I wasn't <laughs> getting paid a lot. <laughs> Trust me. Right. It, was a, it was an eye opener once I finally realized what it was like to be an adult and working on a very small salary. But I really loved it. And uh, I enjoyed just telling stories and helping people and educating people. Certainly don't always enjoy the negativity that comes with it. And that was even 20 years ago. But um, I certainly love being able to, you know, just educate and inform people. It was, I I enjoyed it. That's awesome. As as a matter of fact, I have an 11 year old daughter. Well, I have three children, but I have twins that are 11 and they're in elementary school right now. And they, this is their first year, their school does morning news. And so, so they all get an opportunity to go on the news and and be a reporter and, or, or report on something specific. And it's so cute. I love watching it. And my daughter's insanely shy, but she actually has really embraced this and jumped right in is in loving it. So, and then her brother, my son will come home and he'll show me the videos. He's like, look at Lily on TV, mom. It's so funny. (laughs) I love it. That's awesome. I I know. I know. It's so great. So, so anyway, I know that, I mean, you had a very successful career in journalism. How long were you in journalism? Over, well, how long were you in that part of it? Yes. Because I know yes. you, you've kind of continued on, but in a different capacity. Yeah. Um, for over 15 years, almost 16 years. And uh, I started as a weekend anchor and reporter and then um, transitioned to doing more of the main anchoring kind of thing from different markets. But what was difficult about journalism um, was the fact that you just have to move around so much in order to advance, you know, especially in the beginning. Certainly some people will stay where they are and, you know, form their own legacy and their own community. But honestly, if you want to continue to climb the ladder, you have to be willing to, to move to different markets and advance that way and then find the place that you want to land. Um, but I I loved it. And the investigative reporter component of it, I really got that bug um, by just really seeing some fantastic journalists that I work with. And I really wanted to learn to be um, a good storyteller and understand the fundamentals. Because even at that time, I just thought that it was very hard for me for people to think, well, she's an attractive blonde. Of course, she's young and she's cheaper than the previous. And I just didn't want um, people to be able to to get away with saying that I was just nothing more than just a mouthpiece. And right. so I really dug into, you know, trying to be different, finding a way to stand apart and really show my my grit, so to speak. But it was funny because I, I'll tell you the story um, and it really bothered me and it still does to this day, but it's the truth in so many ways, I think overall, especially for women right now, um, I had gotten to to be an evening anchor and I was making a good salary, but I also was the the primary lead of the investigative team in this particular news market. And I had won an Emmy Award and I was so excited about it and proud of it. I spent so much time researching and, and really making, trying to make a difference. And I remember calling my agent at the time and he said, well, that's cute. 
And I said, Oh my. And he's like, Well, honey, he's like, you know, you just have to go out there every day, speak well, look the part, and you'll continue to advance. You know, that's cute that you like to report, but just focus on looking good and just speaking well. And I was just thinking to myself, all my efforts here, but you know, it is what it is. And I see that now playing out in so many different ways, I think, with social influencers out there. You know, mm -hmm. I just feel like, you know, TikTok, obviously there's a lot of people making a lot of money, but it bothers me to see young girls think that just because they get out there and dance and do whatever on TikTok, they're smart girls, you know, they, mm -hmm. and we'll never hear from them because they think that that's the way to fame. And so I could go off on a tangent on that, but right. <laughs> that's my little piece of it as a journalist, I was like, it's not cute. I worked really hard for this. Right. Right. But it defined me and it actually made me more confident in myself. So it didn't matter. I mean, I was frustrated with that, but it, it was me being able to build my own confidence as a journalist. I love that. And I feel like, you know, we, we see so much that there's so many careers out there that that really kind of dictate and drive even your personal life. It doesn't give you necessarily flexibility, and sometimes we just do it to ourselves, right? We we become workaholics. I know I've been in, been down that path myself, where I kind of made work my everything, and then you realize, okay, you start to sacrifice other things in order to give it all at work. So good for you for for really kind of carving your own way and finding a way to make it work. So I also know that you left the traditional journalism and started your own company, which, yeah. which is amazing, Haas Communications. So congratulations on that. Mm -hmm. And you've taken kind of your own expertise and now you help your own clients to leverage and use these expertise to grow their own businesses. Talk, talk a little bit more, talk a little more about that. Yeah, so I had seen even towards the end of when I was anchoring the news where bigger PR firms um, with the big retainers and the big you know logos and everything would call at us at the news um, station. I get an email and say, can we pay you to be a consultant for a day to come in and tell us why we didn't get the placement for our clients? And I started to realize that no matter how many, you know, master's degrees that these people had, they didn't understand the formula of what was happening in a newsroom because they just simply hadn't had that background. And so I really recognized that there was a huge niche uh, or a hole, so to speak, in being able to produce really good results for clients just by using what I already knew. You know, I knew that I could get people on TV if I just help the reporter do their job. And essentially that has been kind of the key to building my business and grateful that it's continued to build over the last eight years. Um, we are we are fortunate that we get really good results. We select the clients first very well, but also um, my team and I, we're only former journalists. So I really believe that we understand the needs of a reporter. We understand the needs of a producer in a way that a lot of these other firms don't. Um, so, for example, I mean, I have a client who recently was working with a reporter in New York City and literally the reporters in New York City are women in high heels, whatever. They're shooting and they're editing their own stories every day and sometimes wow. two or three stories in a day. And so it's a changing medium. You know, media is so different than it used to be. You don't have the photographer that comes out and does all the editing for you. You're not spoiled. So having said that, we understand that if we can serve the perfect story to somebody on a time crunch and they can trust us and they can recognize that our experts are always going to be vetted, so to speak, in the best way we can, and we make their job easy, our job gets easy. So that's kind of the backbone of how I built um, our business and get results. Right. So, so transitions are never easy, right? Especially when you're talking careers and everything else, because it really does impact everything in your life. And you made the decision to, you know, leave one career and start your own company, which takes such courage in itself. How, what made, what kind of drove you down that path and how did you find that courage to really just say, this is, this is where I need to take this? You know, I had been watching on the, you know, ratings and everything were continuing to diminish basically because social media was, you know, I reports were so common and we were constantly in a flux trying to race to beat the local, you know, media or social media, I should say. 
And so I saw the trend coming and it was uh, one of those things that I was wondering, you know, at some point I'm going to transition at some point, I'm going to do something different, but I never really um, had a deadline, so to speak. But then Mm -hmm. I went through a a divorce and um, I was an evening anchor and reporter. And so that meant I would go in at one o'clock in the afternoon and typically don't get home until 11 p.m. And I had a young son at the time. And so he was just getting out of school at two o'clock in the afternoon when I would be going into work. And I recognized that I was not going to be able to spend quality time with him at all. Um, And it, you know, when you go through a very stressful situation like a divorce, um, you recognize full throttle that you've got to make a change or, you know, other people are going to be impacted. And that was my son. So I had to do it. And I did it Mm -hmm. during that time. um, And I look back now and I think it was such a blessing because it really pushed me to do something that I may have never had the courage to do. Um, But you know how it is when Tony Robbins always talks about pain versus pleasure. Mm. You attach enough pain to something, you won't do it. But if you attach enough pleasure to it, you're going to do it no matter what, you know, and that burn the boat, so to speak. Like I had no choice. I had to do it um, and figure it out. And then a lot of things, you know, kind of were unstable during that time. It was Mm -hmm. tough when you start a new career like that. And you, you know, it's just a lot, you know, to go through all at once. And I was fortunate to land on my feet the way I did. Um, but a lot of people out there who are just so stressed going through these transitions, I feel for them because it is scary. I mean, I can't tell you how many nights and I know so many people can relate. Um, You just lay awake at night and wonder like, can I do this? You know, and what about this? You know, it's a lot of anxiety. So what got you through it? Gosh, you know, a lot of it was going back to the same things that got me into TV in the first place. Believe it or not, Tony Robbins, (laughs) Uh, you know, I read the book when I was like 16 years old and I would listen to the tapes and stuff like that uh, all the time. And I really um, forced myself to listen to good things every morning, get back into strong habits uh, and to work out every morning and have Mm. that audio in my head. Uh, And then, you know, I will say that I had some dark times, you know, during that time and it's nothing is foolproof. Right. Right. But every time I would take a dive down, somehow I would always know that, you know, and thank God for therapy, too. But somehow I, I would always try to fall back and realize I've been in a bad spot before and somehow I made it. You know, I have I knew and I believed in the fight that I had internally to survive and uh I had to really get real with myself, though, because I was so easily, you know, talking down to myself and mm. so easily trying to believe that, you know, I'm not going to make it. This won't work um, and, and made some mistakes along that way. But um, overall, it has been just this continuous um, desire to, to stay positive and to try to improve myself and try mostly to be a good example for my son, you know, and I I so want him to see me as a hard worker and to also want to achieve good things and be good along the way to people. You know, it's so, I I talked to so many people and telling their stories and, you know, we've all been through transitions in our lives and it really all comes back to that internal narrative and what we're telling ourselves. And just like you, I think, you know, we, we get into those dark places and we're like, I'm, I'm no good. I'm a failure. I'm this. And you telling you're telling yourself all these things. And in the reality is if you really stop and think about it and kind of pull yourself out of it, you say, is that true? Do right. I really believe that about myself? And then inevitably there's that voice that says, of course, that's not true. Right. And it's so hard to find that sometimes in those dark places. But I also think that it is, you know, hearing all the different stories and everyone going through all the different transitions, the one thing that is consistent is once you finally made the decision that, you know, I'm just going to focus on the positive. I'm going to focus on going, moving forward. Like you said, with your son, you had to be a good influence on him. And I think that that is such an inspiration for so many of us when we go through these things, because you want to spare your children from it, you know, as much as you can. Um, But then also let them know that, hey, life is hard, but you can get through it. And so, so often it's right here about that internal narrative and what you're telling yourself. So that is so, so true. And so I know you went through that transition. I know it was, it was tough going through that, but you've had amazing success in your business. 
And what do you contribute that to? You know, it has really been um, recognizing what I don't do well uh, Mm -hmm. and also recognizing what I do do well and focusing on that. In the beginning, I was trying to handle too much. um, And I was so excited about another venture that I had as well, um, which was a startup company that I really believed in. And it did not take off because I was trying to do too much at the same time. And I, you know, I place a lot of blame on myself for that because sometimes, you know, you and I were talking just before, like we can get shiny object syndrome, but we can get super excited mm-hmm. about all kinds of different things. The in pretty much every time I've seen that I've made a mistake, it's either been because of the fact that I tried to take on too much or I've tried to um not trust my gut. You know, we mm-hmm. all have gut reactions to things. And if we don't make the right choices and do the right things, um, we'll pay for it sooner or later, you know, and uh, I really believe in that. But having strong faith and believing in that. And I will say the biggest thing is forgiving myself for a lot of the mistakes that I've made. That I think that's a huge one. That is a really tough thing for people to do. We can forgive others, but we have a really hard time forgiving ourselves. And I think that's why we always say we're our toughest critics, because it's true. We really are hard on ourselves. And I have, I've talked about this on the show, but I have a life coach and she told me, she said, how about instead of approaching yourself with judgment, why don't you approach yourself with curiosity? Mm -hmm. And I, that was such an eye opener for me. And I so appreciated that conversation and really starting to focus on, wait, why am I beating myself up when why did I make this decision? And, you know, really start to think about it and, and bringing some self-compassion to the table. And I don't know why, but it's so difficult for us to do that, but it is, I think, so critical and so important. It took me, you know, in kind of a separate situation, but it was an eye opener for me when I started comparing things that I went through as a child or adolescent or whatever. And I started giving myself a hard time about it. And then I was in therapy and my therapist said, you know, how would you act or what would you have done with your son? Like when you Mm -hmm. can use your child as an example of something, you realize like, oh my goodness, I would never allow my son to do X, Y, and Z. And if people around me were allowing that, then that something's wrong there. And so you can't, it's so easy to blame yourself, even when you're not, you know, even old enough to to know better or you feel like you should have known everything and never made a bad choice. But when you can look at it through your child's eyes and be a parent in that respect, you realize like, gosh, I have to give myself compassion because nobody was there to protect me as a child from whatever happened. And I would and then you look at it and go, I would never do that to my son or look another way on some stuff that happened to me as a as an adolescent. So I really think that a lot of it is just having compassion um, and looking at things from a bigger picture. And, you know, again, even as an adult over the last, you know, since my divorce and since all of this stuff, I mean, I feel like there were so many things that I could have done differently, but then I have to realize, you know, gosh, I was in some tough times too, you know, and right. the only way we can grow is to learn from those mistakes and to try to be better the next day. And certainly, you know, forgiving yourself again and just recognizing, well, that was not good, but let's move forward. And how do we fix that? You know? Right. Right. And, you know, also there's an added level of complexity for you in being a journalist and going through these things. You're in the public eye. How did that play a role in, in, in how that impacted you? Yeah, it was not easy, honestly. And I'm actually, um, a lot of people would think I'm an extrovert or whatever. I'm actually shy. And it kind of resonated with me with you talking about your daughter getting on camera. You're like, oh my gosh, she seems the bigger in life. And then you Mm -hmm. know that she's more of shy. It's easier, I think, when you just have like a platform like that to be yourself and not think about all the people watching. But when I started to think about, you know, leaving TV and then, you know, starting my own business. And then not, not too soon after that, getting into a new relationship and having that, um, you know, it's like you want everything on the outside to look like it's all working and you're ashamed to be able to say, gosh, this is, this is a failure, you know, and it's the same thing for my startup company. You know, it's like, it's really hard to give up, you know, you want to keep trying, but at some point you realize you know, is it worth it? You know, and is this the right time to be doing X, Y, and Z? And 
are we, are people really paying attention to us? That's the other thing. Like I always thought, oh gosh, what does everybody think? And you know, if I do this or that, most people don't even care, you know, right. I mean, <laughs> it's like I made it so, you know, important in my head. And it's like the only real thing that I've learned through all of this um, time is the fact that the only thing I got to say, I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. I've got to say, I'm sorry to God and I've got to recorrect, you know, and mm -hmm. most people who are watching through social media, I mean, social media is such a falsehood anyway, these days, like everybody's got filters on and nobody's really as happy as they look on social Absolutely. media. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so, it, it, it's almost like a, sorry, it's almost like a challenge to see whose life can look the best in social media. It's like a competition and it's like, when does it end? I mean, when do we start being our authentic, uh, authentic selves and showing people who we really are? And I think that's where you start to find freedom in your life. When you get to that place where you're like, I can just do that and, and be that. And it's difficult. It's very, very hard because there are a lot of critics out there, especially when you're in the public eye. So thank you for sharing that. And talk to me a little more. I mean, we, we often talk about the great successes. I mean, if you look, if talking about looking at things on the surface, if we look at your career, you've had a very successful career, you know, you've won many awards, you've started your own, you started your own company, you've grown a successful business. What are some of the op other obstacles you faced along the way? Lots of obstacles. Yeah. And, um, you know, probably number one, you know, that I'm always my worst critic. It was my internal voice. That was a big obstacle. Um, I also had gotten into a situation where I was, um, I was in a relationship with somebody who was extremely emotionally abusive. And, mm. you know, I, I look at that and I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but in some ways I look at it and I think to myself, it was a blessing now, um, mainly because I've learned a lot about how resilient I can be, number one. And number two, I have, believe it or not, I have compassion for that person now because I feel like hurt people end up hurting people, you know, and right. I don't think it was all malicious. I think a lot of it was just um, somebody really fighting their own battle and then, you know, pushing it out on somebody else. And I've learned a lot about, um, you know, taking care of myself. I, I exposed myself to that because I didn't believe that I deserved any better or I believed all the stuff that was being said to me. And, you know, I had a lot of people in my life who just were like, you know, why, why do you keep doing this to yourself? Why are you still in this? You know, if you, if it's so bad, just leave. And, um, I think that's a really good conversation that needs to be had more, uh, especially mm -hmm. in situations like that, because it is easy on the surface to say, what the heck are you doing? But when you're so into it and you're so down on yourself and you really believe that there's no way out, you think, well, this is the best it's going to get. I better get better, you know, or I got to figure it out. And it took, um, a lot of personal work therapy, of course, but also, you know, you can complain all day long to a therapist and spend a lot of money, which I still continue to do. But <laughs> at the same time, I've often said, I don't want to keep coming back here and saying the same things. I don't want to keep complaining about stuff that I know I can change. It's just that I'm not doing it, you know? And so right. I think it should be a means to an end. We should all be trying to improve instead of sitting around complaining about it. And uh, that's really been kind of the, the big obstacle for me is learning how to forgive myself for the things that I've done wrong, learn how to make better choices and forgive um, myself for allowing myself to go through some really tough stuff because that in itself can also hold people back. Like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed that I've stayed in this mess and people know it's, again, I'm thinking more people care about me. They don't, nobody <laughs> cares, you know? All they wanna do is hear somebody um, with a, a, a positive story, I think. Nobody wants to hear this negative stuff anymore, or at least I don't. And uh, it really comes down to recognizing you know, the challenges and trying to make the best of them and trying to be a better person. That's, that's what I've tried. And it's working, um, most of the time, right? You know? yeah. And yeah, we try, but honestly, I think as far as even growing businesses, you know, um, if you're good to your clients and you care about them and they know, even you're not going to be perfect all the time, but if you communicate with them authentically, um, mm -hmm. they're, they're always going to have your back too, you know? And, uh, I think that's at the end of the day, when they know at the core, you mean, well, that it, it serves, so serves us all well in all areas of life. 
For sure. And I, t I completely agree with that. And, you know, I think it's interesting as we think about our stories and what people want to hear. And you're right. I think, I think we're all exhausted of the negative speak yeah. and want to get away from that. But I do think it's so important that when we do tell our stories, that we're sharing all aspects of it, not just the, the great stuff and the fun stuff, but it's also talk about the hardships. And I admire you because you absolutely do that. And you have such a strong message about, you know, life is what you make it, work hard. And, you know, you've really focused on, hey, I've been through some tough things, but I've overcome and I've, you know, continued to, I continue to thrive. And that's really why we do this podcast, right? It's to share, share those stories, help people find relatable stories that help them in their own lives to thrive and overcome their own challenges. You know, we talk a lot about mental fitness because we spend a lot of time in this society, in our society, you know, talking about physical fitness and staying fit and eating healthy, but we, we really still don't talk a whole lot about our mental fitness. I'm curious, what does mental fitness mean to you and how do you, what are some things that you do to stay mentally fit and keep you on that positive note and thinking positively? Well, a lot of it is, you know, making sure that I surround myself, whether it's even audio or people in my life or lack thereof, always having people who I look up to or I trust or I um, know will help me grow and vice versa. I always want to be a sounding board for people too, but it's really about consistently making sure I have that in my life. Um, about, I guess, six or eight months ago, I hired a um, mental toughness coach, so to speak. But oh, I love that. Yeah, he's he's fantastic. And, you know, he has a background. He's a former NBA player. And he, it's so interesting how much our life, even if we don't play sports now or maybe did years ago, but it's not part of our life, how much we can really tap into the idea of athleticism and competition and the perseverance in our own business or our own overall life. And um, it's just always amazing to me. There was I was listening to um, a book called uh, Relentless uh, by mm -hmm. Tim Grover, and it, he, you know, he was a former mental uh, NBA coach, well, mental toughness coach, so to speak. But he was with Kobe and you know Michael Jordan and all those folks. And he talks about in the book just you know the consistency that is necessary to improve even small amounts every every day. And so um, this particular coach that I hired, and I actually have him working with my son too, he just really tries to hold me accountable. And that's what I asked him to do. And, you know, he's like, I, it's not going to be fun for you, Christine. Like you have got to, you know, you've got to give me permission. Otherwise, I, you know, I'm not going to help you and you might as well just part ways. And so um, the structure of, you know, making sure that every day, I do X, Y, and Z, and I, I'm responsible to myself for those actions, that is mental fitness for me. Like I, I have to work out every day. Um, I have to meditate for a small portion of time. We've really made a structure of every little goal that I have. And then um, I don't know if you've read the book, Atomic Habits. Yes. But it, yes. It's so good about just like that 1% change. If you move, mm -hmm. it, all of a sudden you look back and you go, wow, all that, it really did, you know, become consistent uh, issues. And I really, it, for good or bad, you know, and so you got to always continue to do that habit stacking, which is what I have been doing um, through his guidance and kind of really planning out what I want, not just for me personally, but for my business too. And uh I sat, like I said, I was so excited about the impact it was having on my life that I had my him start working remotely with my son. And my son's a, a soccer player. He plays goalie mm -hmm. position. And so I just think it's so interesting that so much comes back to sports, you know, the analogies of everything. It's so like, true. I don't play sports now, but it's all about staying in the game, staying focused, you know? And if you listen to the fans and if you listen to all the outward voices of people, whether it's critics in your business or haters online, it, it diverts your focus and you cannot continue to stay strong in your goal setting if you let all that happen. And so I, I love it. Um, and it's really helped me. Um, certainly not perfect. And I love it when he holds <laughs> me, my feet to the fire. But um, like literally sometimes he will FaceTime me in the morning to make sure I am 
I'll, I'm doing exactly what I promised I would do. He just like randomly pick up the phone. He's like, if you don't pick it up, <laughs> like, I want to know, you know, because I, I always say I'll run in the morning or whatever. He's like, if I'm not on the trail, he's uh, he's on me. But I, I that's what you pay for. But at the same time, it's it's those stack stacking of habits. Like now, it's become so much more natural. So to me, that's uh, mental fitness, making sure that my mind is always in the game, so to speak. That's amazing. And I, I love that you actually stepped outside of your comfort zone, hired someone to help you in that area. And I think that's a big piece of it too. I think that's ultimately where growth comes from is when we are willing to step outside of our comfort zones. And I can tell you that is not what I like. I don't like to do that. I really don't. It's Neither. something I really have to push myself and I'm, I'm sure we all do, but I really have to push myself to do that. And I, I think it's just so important that you have you know again it comes back to courage sometimes people say you know why are you making that decision and oftentimes the decision is based in fear because i'm really comfortable here and if i have to do that then i'm gonna you know not be so comfortable and and i think that's so important that we ask ourselves why are we making that decision mm -hmm. but the other thing too is you talked about just resiliency and continuing to continually doing you know, those little things each and every day that help, again, create that growth, but also build those habits. So I think that's also so important. Yes, absolutely. And I also see it working in reverse. You know, if I, if I slack off for a few days, you know, I can tell, like, I'll just go right back to my own patterns. Um, there's a, have you heard of Ed Milet? No. Okay, he's online um, on YouTube and social media, but he's a, a kind of a, also an, a, a Tony Robbins type of person, you know, mm -hmm. but he's also a, a very successful businessman. But I listened to him on Impact Theory recently, and he was talking about the analogy of a thermometer, or I should say a, a thermostat. And he said, you know, if you keep changing the thermostat to a certain place, eventually you're going to get used to the new temperature in, within your body or with whatever you're doing. But if you don't keep that, you're going to naturally go back to where your normal is. And so you have to keep that thermostat right where it needs to be every day and make sure it's set. Otherwise, it's going to fall right back to where your typical um, placement is. And so my goal is to consistently improve my my average, right, instead right. of having to go further back. But I mean, I, a lot of it just for me came out of s sincere necessity. You know, I um I don't have a big family and, you know, that in itself made me stronger and I had to be forced to be stronger to, to handle stuff on my own. You know, the other thing you brought up was, and I think this is such a huge piece and I know it is for me and that's accountability. Yeah. I have the tendency to, I always joke, if, if I turned my camera, you'd see my Peloton sitting right here next to me <laughs> because that was my point. I put it near my desk so that I can, you know, I see it. I can't just walk by it and not, you know, get on it every day, which by, uh, to be honest, I don't get on it every day. And some weeks I do really great and other weeks I don't touch it at all. So, but if I, if I put things in my calendar, if, you know, if I start to schedule it and, and put a little more discipline around my day, I'm much more inclined to do it, but also it comes back to accountability. And I, I've gotten to the point now where I have to ask friends, like, hold me accountable to this. This is a goal of mine. And I'm telling you, it's my goal because I need you to hold me accountable. May, ask me, am I doing it? Ask me what I'm doing. And I, I think that's such a, a huge piece to put into your daily routine is the yeah. accountability side of it. It's so, so, so important. It's so true. Yeah. And, you know, that is one of the challenges, in my opinion, of being a business owner, number one, but number two, working remotely. I feel yes. like you know, back in a newsroom, you know, I was always, you know, kind of in competition. You know, your your colleagues are there and you always want to, you know, at least be at a, a certain level or advancing or whatever. But it's that internal fire that you have. And so when you're working remotely, you know, and nobody's watching, it's so easy to do, like you say, not be accountable of like, oh, okay, well, maybe I'll, you know, take a break here when normally, you know, if anybody was sitting around me, I wouldn't be taking that second coffee break, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, uh, it, it's even, and I think that's why I ended up hiring somebody to help me too, was to make sure that, you know, somebody was watching because when you don't have, you know, somebody around all the time, it's easy to slack. It definitely is. That is absolutely true. So I'm curious if you had just one piece of advice to give the audience about some, you may, maybe someone's going through some tough times. What, 
what would you what would you leave us with that would just maybe inspire people to keep going, keep pushing and yeah, yeah. So it's because of stuff that I've been through on my own. Um, Dr. Joe Dispenza, I, I've listened to him quite a bit and read his book. Um, he has this full, um, God, all of the research is so interesting. Your thoughts are so powerful that even if you are not in an anxious place, if you think about something that will make you anxious, you can cause that physio physiological change in your body. Your heart starts to race, you start to get sweaty, whatever it is, because you have caused yourself mentally to go to a certain place and you have produced the same impact. And you could literally be laying in bed. And so that's you know opposite too, that if you can put yourself in your desired goal, like think of what mm. you want to look like, you think of you know the happiness you want around you and your family you know, the, putting your mental focus on those things can really change um, the duration of your thoughts or your day or whatever it is. So I would say, recognize the power of your thoughts. Um, and I have been just such a terrible um, example of this because I do <laughs> suffer from anxiety. And so like, I would, oh, what about this? And maybe that ailment, maybe that's cancer. You know, I mean, we all have a little bit, but I was getting to the point where I was recognizing how it was impacting my body. You know, it was mm. like, I'm just sitting here and now it's because of my thought that I'm now producing this impact on my body, which is stress and it's not good. Um, but I, I think my takeaway would be really control your thoughts if you can, you know, write down the things that keep you grounded. And, you know, it's so easy to say, well, meditate and take deep breaths and all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, I mean, there is a place in that, but it really comes back to knowing, okay, I'm sitting here today. I don't have to worry about tomorrow. What's going to get me through the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes, next hour to stay focused on what I need to do? It's not about telling myself that I can't do it because that won't help in any way. So it's to me, I think just controlling my thoughts, which I'm still a work in progress, but um, that has really made a big change for me. And and again, I would say go read his book, listen to him on YouTube, Joe, Dr. Joe Dispenza. People heal themselves through their thoughts. That's amazing. I, I'm definitely going to check out that book. And I mean, there's a reason why we hear the term mind body connection. And I think we oftentimes really dismiss the power the mind has on the physical body and, and just how you feel and the decisions you make. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. That was super, super in insightful. I appreciate you sh sharing your story here today. Again, just being vulnerable and opening up to us. I think that's so powerful and it will absolutely inspire and help others to thrive in their own lives. So thank you for being here. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you for this podcast and doing this because I think the more we all give back, the better it is. So thanks for having me. Yes. You've been listening to the Her Journey Told podcast. And this podcast is brought to you by Pivotal Moments Media. Stay tuned and keep watching for more episodes. Thanks. You've been listening to the Her Journey Told podcast powered by Pivotal Moments. For more inspirational content, go to pivotalmoments.org. I'm Sandy Lutton. Thanks so much for joining us. Make sure to keep an eye out for more episodes where podcasts can be heard. See you next time.